<laughs> yes, Katrina. Yes. <laughs> so, Bailey, Brittany, and Jessica, have you guys met Autumn yet, the chicken? I wasn't sure if you guys had gotten to meet her yet. No, you haven't, Jessica? And Bailey hasn't. Okay. And what about you, Brittany? Did you get to meet her? <laughs> well, good. I picked a good night then. Um, well, here, here's a little backstory. Back in the fall, um, some friends of my daughter gave us some baby chickens. She was having problems raising them. She said, Shady, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but to keep dying. And she said, would you take them? And I said, well, sure. Hi, Lita. I said, sure, I'll, I'll take them. So she brought these chickens out to our house, and we have raised chickens as well. And we put them in a little coop. So um, one of these baby chicks was a little black and white striped chick. And I brought her on, um, like I said, it was in the fall for the first night. And I said, so she's going to be our mascot, our ECE mascot. And I think it was Katrina that named her, wasn't it? Didn't you get to pick the name Katrina? <laughs> and she she was tiny. She was she was about this big and just a little fluff ball. And I really wasn't sure um, what type of chicken she was going to be. But um, we're pretty sure she is maybe a one dot. She's black and white. So she is now. Um, I guess about six months old now. And uh, chickens, by the time they're about six months, are generally full grown. And now that we're starting to get um, more daylight, um, she should actually be laying her first egg for the first time here pretty soon. So chickens need to have at least 12 hours of, of sun or, or light in order to produce an egg. So we should be getting Autumn's first egg here pretty soon. So here, here's Autumn. Let me see if she'll work with me. She's going to make some noise for us. Oh, she flopped me in the head with a feather. Can you see her? There we are. She's officially um, full grown. She's mostly sweet. She has pecked me a few times, haven't you? Sometimes she'll get very talkative and talk to me. She likes to try to peck at my ring. She's got a thing for diamonds. Don't you? Will you talk for us? <laughs> so anyway, let me see if I can get a better shot of her so you can see how big she is. She's got this beautiful black and white feathers. And someday she's going to She's going to lay a beautiful egg for us. Yeah. That'll be good. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> she's going to throw a fit. That's a chicken fit. Let's try it again. Okay. Say bye to everybody. <laughs> so now you have met our official. There we go. Uh, okay. Lita, Lita said hi to you. Hi, Autumn. <laughs> now you've met, met our official ECE mascot. So if anybody asks, yes, we do have a chicken mascot. I don't think any other program has that. So we're, we're pretty unique, okay? <laughs> I put her down in her little box. She'll probably be okay. Um, whenever nighttime comes around, chickens really short, so almost shut off their brain. They are very easy to catch when it's dark. And um, that's why um, a lot of the chicken houses where they raise them for meat um, come to pick them up at night because you could easily pick up a chicken. During the day, they're harder to catch. So right now, she's already laid down in the box and she's ready to go to sleep. So um, in um, maybe June is what we're thinking this summer. We might have baby pigs, so um, we may have a baby pig mascot too, and I'll be sure to show you guys, okay? <laughs> you do need to see those in person, Bailey. They are so sweet and so cute, baby pigs are. <laughs>
Now, it, here's the thing. We spoil our animals. They all have names. We don't eat any of them. So they're pets. We do eat the eggs from the chickens, though. So, um, you know, we, we do take their eggs, but the hens get to live out their years well beyond they've stopped laying eggs. It's okay. They still get to stay in our little coop. And every once in a while, they get we have about five acres, and they get to get out and peck around and look for food. So it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe in June, those of you that will still be around them, I've got some people that will be graduating before then. Yep, Autumn's going to sleep now. Okay, on to ECE. Now that you've had a little tour of my farm, <laughs> someday I'll have to take you outside for a lesson and show you guys what we have outside. On to our announcements. Week three means we have one and a half weeks left in our course. Um, so basically the rest of this week and then all of next week and we'll be done. Um, March 1st, I just want to remind you real quick, I posted this on our Facebook page as well today, will be our field trip to Tulsa Educare at the Kendall Whittier site near to you for those of you that are around Tulsa. Beautiful building. Fantastic program, and um, this is a this is a great way to tour a facility, see how they have things set up, see if you might be interested in working there in the future, and just sort of get your foot in the door as well. So um, this might be a great time to make a very positive first impression. So whenever you show up. You know, you don't have to be dressed for a job interview, but look sharp. Um, you know, you want them to remember you because it could be just a few months down the road when you're looking for a spot. Oh, there's a few more people. Hi, Maria. Hi, Jasmine. You may be looking for a spot to do your externship at, or you may be looking for a job, and I do know that they are currently hiring. So those of you that can make it, show up at 3.30 on March 1st. Plus, I'd love to see you in person as well. Let me get some names written down here. Great. Um, Jasmine and Maria, you just missed the chicken. <laughs> I, brought, um, I brought Autumn on. So what you'll have to do, you'll be in your work uniform. That's OK, too, Lita. So Maria and Jasmine, if you want to meet Autumn, you'll need to look at the recording tomorrow. Look at the look at the blackboard recording, and you can see Autumn. She's making noises right now. <laughs> um, also, let me see. Oh, did everybody get the email on the bonus point opportunity on writing a blog? I wanted to see. You did. Okay, great, great. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to have that as a, as a possibility for some of you guys. Um, I know a few people have missed assignments. I've had a couple people that have missed quizzes. And this is a great way to make up those points. And if you haven't missed anything, um, it's a great way to get, get extra points. So maybe you've got a 95 and you want to have 100%. Here's your chance. Um, plus, writing a blog. Um, is is a great um, experience. I was really nervous the first time I did one. Um, after I did it for the first time, I was like, oh yeah, I, I could do this on a pretty regular basis, no problem. So um, it, it's good to, to get one sort of under your belt to see how it works. So you write the blog, and my top blogs will be chosen to be put on our CCC ECE blog website. So you'll sort of be famous and getting bonus points. So I want to encourage you guys to do that. Um, and you have until the last day of our course to do that. So um, if you haven't seen it yet, be sure and check your email to go in and um, look for more of the details. Um, also, our final quiz for this course will be this week. Be sure to take that before midnight Sunday. Um, we do not have a quiz in week four, so week three will be your final quiz. Our final project is due Sunday, February 21st, coming up soon, and I want you to be able to finish strong. You watch Dog with a Blog? <laughs> I know that I know that show, Lita. That's funny. 
It's cute. Yes, it's a talking dog. <laughs> okay, our student question of the week. I had someone ask me, do I have to do an externship? And the answer is yes, if you have no previous ECE employment experience, basically. Um, externship is basically, we're wanting to make sure when you graduate, you have these classes under your belt, you've had these great um, experiences of creating documents and lesson plans uh, and doing center planning from our classes, but we also want you to have the experience of doing it in, in person. There goes my chicken. <laughs> you guys hear? Okay, so Jasmine and Maria, since you didn't get to see her, she hopped out of the box. She wanted you to see her. Okay. <laughs> I need to close the box. I don't want her walking around the carpet. Now we're good. I have off-white carpet though, and that would not do well with chicken plops. So, <laughs> so externship. If you have had no experience in ECE, then you definitely have to do this. It's part of your education. It's part of your training. Now, the answer is no, you don't have to do an externship if you can provide proof of ECE experience. Maybe you've worked in a daycare, maybe you've worked in a preschool, um, in, in a public school as an assistant, it needs to have been full time, and around a year is the minimum because we want to be sure you've had lots of experience that um, you wouldn't have otherwise. So if you have had ECE experience, what you do is you contact your admissions representatives, maybe you may have had Pooja, you may have had Arlene, um, you may have had Becky, I'm not sure who your admissions rep was, but you contact them, you ask for the PLA application, prior learning assessment application. It costs $25 to apply, you have to turn in a resume showing your experience. I believe you have to have a reference letter from a previous employer saying what you've done. And you have to write up a short essay about your experience, telling us what experience you have had. Maybe you've done lesson plans, you've done classroom management. Um, you know, it just depends. And then what we do is we go over this as a group and decide if you can basically opt out of externship. So you have to fill out the application, submit your $25. You need to do this several months before externships so that we know whether or not you'll be doing an externship and we know if we need to schedule for one. So I have um, probably 50% of my students um, have had previous learning um, experience. Maybe they're already working in a daycare or a preschool, in that instance, you're fine as well. So, so there's, there's a yes and a no on that. Um, you have a two-month limit, yes, on getting your hours in. That's right, Katrina, because you need 180 hours. And if you're doing that um, you know, full-time, we're looking at a little over four weeks. If you're doing that part-time, it's going to take a little bit longer. If you're doing your externship outside of a full-time job, you may have to do that. Um, Bailey, actually nannying, I believe, would count. Um, because what we would have to do is have you apply for it. Because I know you've done it for over a year. You would have to explain to us um, some of the things that you did as a nanny. And we would assess that and determine. So yeah, I would apply for it, definitely. Um, Jessica, you can sometimes start a little bit early um, by contacting Stephanie Lawrence. Sometimes they can get your hours started a few, um, a few weeks before you actually start. Yep. 
Yes, 22.5 hours a week to meet the limit. Yes, you're, you're about right, Katrina, that's right. So, um, yes, but also Stephanie could guide you a little more too on your hours as well. So, Bailey, yes, I'd like to see you do that. Um, even though it costs $25, um, what you wind up not having to pay for is basically a whole class because externship is considered a class and therefore it's the same fee as a class. So you actually wind up saving a lot of money plus um, that's one less month that you have to work towards your degree. Um, oh, Lita, you worked at Head Start? A long time ago. Huh, I may have to talk to you a little more about that. Um, like how long and what all you did, Lita, okay? So that that could be a possibility as well. So I thought that was an excellent question. I wanted to pass that along to you guys because I know I get lots of questions about externship. Yeah. All right, so let's move on into chapter three, guys. What I have tonight is not so much a lot of um, words on slide. Um, what I have uh, more tonight are examples of things that you're going to need for your final project, examples of lesson plans, examples of webs, because I've had lots of questions about those. I want to be sure you completely understand what I'm looking for in your final project. So we're going to talk a little bit about curriculum. What is curriculum? It's everything, linguistic, cognitive, aesthetic, emotional, physical, it's everything that we use to help um, grow this child, to help expand their knowledge, to increase their physical activity. Um, so curriculum is, is sort of everything that goes into the program. Even cleaning up after lunch is part of the curriculum. I wanted to show you guys real quick, these are the current OK Department of Education past standards for pre-K. So we're talking about um, children that are getting ready to enter kindergarten specifically in Oklahoma that are on the pre-K program. Now I want you to think about what we've been talking about with developmentally appropriate practice. I'm just going to blaze through these really quick, but I want you to notice the um, similarities between developmentally appropriate practice terms and the standards for pre-K. For example, um, early childhood programs should be appropriate for the age, developmental level, and special needs of each child, just as we talk about that. Um, they should be connected to their families. Um, teaching is based on knowledge. Again, we're talking basically about that, aren't we? The language environment foster, fosters all areas of, of development, intellectual, language, physical, social, emotional. Early childhood programs should, and let me click over, provide a curriculum that builds upon what children already know, provide units and themes of interest, provide a literary rich environment, um, a variety of activities, use technology, provide a safe environment designed to meet the um, age group served, provide a climate that is active, hands-on learning with day-to-day -day learning experiences, and the last one says provides a balance of teacher-directed, child-directed um, activities, environment that's sensitive to cultural language and learning differences, provides ongoing process of collecting information, doing observations, and these curriculum guidelines are intended um, to be recommended curriculum for children attending ECE programs in Oklahoma. So what really stood out to me are those things that I put in red that are definitely very similar to developmentally appropriate practices that we've been talking about. And I thought this was um, pretty neat because it's specific for Oklahoma. Now, you, those of you that are not in Oklahoma, um, go to your state's website and you can pretty easily look these up as well um, to see what your state requires. And chances are it's going to be pretty similar. I want to see just really quick that I've got everybody written down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm missing one per, oh, Lee, I don't have you written down. There we go. 
I want to be sure you guys are getting your points for being here. Okay, so those were the OK Pass standards, basic standards. All right, let's move on then to our pictures to planning. We're going to talk a little bit about lesson planning, and I love the questions that have come up in the discussion boards. Um, this is one of the most important things that you do as an ECE teacher is planning. Um, the cycle of planning, if we start down here, let me get my pointer. I'll use the smiley face tonight. See where it says planning at the bottom of the page? What support will students need? What data do I need? I'm in the process. I'm trying to decide what to do. I then go into, so maybe I've written up an idea for a lesson plan. I then use that lesson plan in instruction, delivering support and implementing assessment. After I've done a lesson plan, I look back on it. I assess myself. I assess how well it went over with the children. Did they like it? Did they hate it? Gather some information. And then I do a critical evaluation of it and decide what's next. I'm, am I going to do that lesson plan again? Was it a flop? Was it fantastic? You just never know. Sometimes whenever you're making a plan, it just doesn't quite work out as well on site as it did on paper. So um, the, the thing is, I want you to know as a teacher, you're constantly doing this. You're, you're constantly going through this cycle. Um, my husband contacted me earlier today and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working on my PowerPoint for tonight. And I said, you know, this is my second time to teach this class for CCC, and um, I need to make the PowerPoint better. I said, the first time I did it, it, it was kind of lame. <laughs> and he, he laughed at me, but he understands. I, you know, I said, the first time I taught this class, um, it was my first time teaching um, a live lecture through a video camera. I was so nervous. I had so many things written out, so many slides that you had to read. And through these past eight months of doing live lectures every week, I've learned each time what works a little bit better. So you're constantly improving. You're constantly assessing yourself. And you're constantly making changes as needed during the planning process. Now, let's look at different ways to plan specifically for ECE. Let's talk about themes really quick. Planning around themes. Some of the advantages, very interesting and fun, um, easy to link activities. You can become very immersed in the topic with your decorations, with the things that you use in the classroom. Um, you can easily involve the family because they know each week or month what your, what your theme is, right? And one that's not on here is that there are so many ideas for themes out here. Now, here's where Pinterest comes in again. If you go back 20 years ago for early childhood education, you had to have books on themes. You had to order things through the phone. Um, you had to um, network with early childhood educators, maybe go to meetings to get ideas for themes. But now we can uh, sit, on, sit at home and pull up Pinterest, and if you put in ECE themes, you're going to get hundreds and thousands of ideas off Pinterest alone, and not just the words, but the pictures of how the classrooms are set up and, and what all the, the teacher used. So it makes it so much easier. You don't have to come up with all this creativity on your own. Um, some of the disadvantages, sometimes you narrow the content a little bit choosing a theme. Um, they have to depend on the adults in the classroom as the guide, and sometimes there's uh, not as much room for flexibility, right? But, you know, there, there's always advantages and disadvantages either way. Here's an example I found on the Internet. This is thematic planning, an example, and this would be for the year. Okay, so this one, you can tell it's a little old one. It starts in September 2011, and it goes all the way through summer 2012. So this is in one year. So let's take this month, for example. We're still in February, 
It did. It helps you with the Wednesday assignment. Good, good. <laughs> so if, if we look at February in 2012, you can tell their themes were fairy tales, treats for my sweets, probably went along with Valentine's week. You are what you eat, and open wide, probably had something to do with teeth. So for February, they had a theme for each week. Now, if you're doing thematic planning, sometimes you'll do the theme for the week. Sometimes you'll have a single theme for a month. Now, an advantage of that is you can really go in depth in a month on a single topic, and you can decorate the room one time and leave it that way for four weeks. Now, this advantage, though, is that maybe they get tired of that theme and you need a change. Um, so you do the weekly planning, but you're having to change more often. So you have to figure out what's best for your kids and what's best for your center. Now, if you look in February, you'll also see they do the letters P, Q, and R, the numbers 10 and 11. They focus on the color pink and the shape of a heart. So they have specific things that they've picked out for each month. So this is thematic yearly planning. Now, if we hop over here, here is an example, thematic planning examples by the week. Again, this is yearly, though. It's just in a different format. So let's hop down to February again. This one, it's a little more broad. It's just telling the theme for the week. In February, the first week, we're going over groundhogs and animal habitats. So this might be for maybe four- and five-year-olds. We're going over dental health in week two, Valentine's and the heart in week three, spring sports in week four. So they're kind of getting ready for the spring. So you can tell there's St. Patrick's Day in March, um, in the fall, let me see, in November, they have a Thanksgiving week, so in Halloween in October. So they have uh, included holidays in there, but they have also included picnics and circuses and amphibians and movies and popcorn. I think these are all fantastic ideas. So thematic plans again. So next let's look at, so you might pick a theme. To, to plan your curriculum. Another thing you might do, instead of picking a theme, is use an emergent curriculum, which we've talked about in our past couple weeks, in fact, too. Um, we know it's responsive to the children. It arises naturally, helps them connect with the learning experiences. Um, you guys know kind of the basics of emergent curriculum. So maybe you use emergent curriculum instead of a theme. However, I want you to know if you're using emergent curriculum, that does not mean you're not planning. You still have to have a plan. So here's an example of emergent curriculum planning. This one is actually specifically for a curriculum that's called creative curriculum. Have you guys ever used, has anyone ever used creative curriculum out there? It's a pretty popular one. Oh, I could, I could send it to you, Bailey, if you need it. No? Um, I'm wanting to say, I think it's um, Kinder Care that uses creative curriculum. You like that one? Oh, fantastic. Well, hey, Bailey, send me an email, and I will email it to you, okay? Just send it to me as a, a reminder. I think it's a fantastic one. Now, you guys know that there are hundreds of planning sheets out there, hundreds. And you find the one that's best for you, that's best for your age group, or you may be working in a center where they want you to use a specifically type of planner. So this is an example, though. And why I like this one is it's a little more open-ended. We've got large group activities. This will be for the week. Small group activities that you list. Certainly, yes, yeah, send me an email, Lita. As a reminder not, I will email it to you. Um, you've got individual activities. 
and then you've got outdoor activities. So this would be a place where you make your notes for the week that at a glance you could look at it and go, okay, this is what we're doing. Down here you've got a spot for notes. And then since it is emergent curriculum and we're wanting to look at what the child wants to do as well, down here in the children's interest area we've got health and safety we might be teaching dramatic play, art, math and science, cooking, toys, music, sand and water. So you're picking the things that, um, that your children in the group will want to do as an emergent type of a curriculum that's more natural. So it's not that you're not going to have a plan. You still have to have a plan. Hey, there's trees. Fantastic. So that is planning. Now let's look at webbing. Now webbing, um, you're going to be using your planning for our final project. You're also going to have to create a couple webs. And I wanted to help um, distinguish between these two a little bit better. Webbing is basically grab a sheet of paper, draw a circle around the center section of it, and start building your web off of it with ideas. Think of a spider web, okay? So you put the central theme or concept in the middle of your paper and you're drawing your lines. So it helps you come up with basic ideas for planning. It helps you um, illustrate how each idea builds off another. So maybe you have to um, teach one concept before the next. Um, it helps you think outside the box and be a little more creative. And it even helps if you have more than one person help you with this because, you know, more minds are even better. Welding helps you know where the lesson plan is maybe weak and where they're strong. So let's say you're doing a concept web and you know that you've taught some of these concepts on the left, but you haven't gotten near the ones on the right. So you might um, look at ideas to improve for the things that you add the next time you're teaching that. So the purpose of webbing, exactly like a spider web, Lady, you got it. The purpose of webbing, webbing is a brainstorming session. And you know something else you might use webbing for is when you're coming up with ideas for your blog, for your extra points. Uh, you might get your idea for what you want to write about, and then you might um, break it down into the main topics you'd like to cover in each paragraph. So there's lots of different uses for webbing. You're welcome to draw this web out by hand. You can use pencil, sharpies on straight paper, or you can use um, um, a PowerPoint slide to do that, or you could use Word to do that. It's up to you. Um, I'm a fan of just doing it by hand, though, and taking a picture of it. So here's some examples. Here is a concept web. Now, I, I found one on the internet, and this one was for T-Rex. So we've got T-Rex is our central concept. All the kids like dinosaurs, right? Almost all of them. So we focus on T-Rexes. Well, what can we teach about T-Rex? The first thing that stands out, of course, would be the size of the T-Rex. We can also teach the diet. What do they eat? how big are their teeth. Maybe we can find um, some things that we could borrow from a library or from a museum. Um, what was their skin like? Where are their fossils found? So basically, where did they live and where did they die? Um, how long are their arms compared to their body? How long were their claws? And when they lived? So these are all ideas of concepts about the T-Rex that you could teach. Now you notice that we're not, e we're not focusing on activities here. We're not even really getting into detail. So a concept web is pretty bare bones, very basic, just a few words, okay? So that's a concept web. Now let's hop over next to an activity web. Now an activity web is a lot more specific. So on this one, I chose birds as our central concept or idea or theme. And here we're going to look at specific activities that you could do 
to teach about birds. So we might have an art center where you build bird nest. So you're going to have, you're going to give me specifics when it comes down to the activity web. You might have a writing center with feathers to walk, feathers to draw with, washable ink on paper. You might have a math center with an egg carton and a sorting game with various sizes of fake bird eggs. You might have a science center with binoculars, a sensory table with plastic eggs and water, a block center with toy birds and bird cages, and lastly, a reading center with books and magazines that deal with birds. So can you tell how we went from in a concept web very broad to in an activity web looking at specific activities that could be used? And that's what I want you to do on your final project as well. That's where I want to see the difference. The concepts are the things that you could teach about. So if we go back to the T-Rex, we could look at numbers as far as how tall they are, how many inches, how many feet. But we're not going to spell it out on our concept web. We could look at the different foods in the diet. If this was an activity web, I would want the activities spelled out for each of these. Um, where the fossils are found or a little bit with geography, when they lived. Again, we're looking at times. So concepts are very broad and activities spell out specific activities that could be done. And it's going to be up to you to choose on, um, on your themes for either one of those. Okay, and then lastly tonight, we're going to look at planning forms because, again, this is something you're going to be using. Planning forms allow for open-ended exploration. They allow for evolving ideas of interest. They document emergent interest of the teacher and of the child, and they allow teachers to demonstrate accountability. So let's hop over to a planning form. Here's one that I found online. And what I did is um, in the search box um, in Google, I typed in planning form examples. And I had hundreds come up. Not all of them were early childhood. Not all of them were education related. But this was a nice, simple one that I found. This is a daily lesson plan. And you're going to be doing one of these. A daily lesson plan. You'll notice on the left hand side, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Over here, we've got at the top, we've got what we'll be doing during circle time. And at this center, it looks like that's what you do first thing in the morning. Language arts time, math and science, creative arts, and then large motor. So these are the areas this center has chose to focus on every day. So they want to have an activity in these areas for every day. So you would fill this out as the teacher, what you're going to do each day to address language arts, math, creativity, large motor. Now, before you plan that, if you had your theme for the week, it would help you narrow down on what to focus on for each day as well. Um, I also like in this plan that for circle time, it's got it broken down into music and finger plays, what you're going to do, what book you will read, and what small activity you will do. So they do that every day in the morning during circle time. And remember, we had a um, discussion board that sort of dealt with this as well. Now, you may feel like, oh, you don't have to do that much planning, but you really do. Um, one of the worst things with early childhood is to not know what you're doing next and to not be ready with an activity. So your planning is so important. It really is. Here's another example, uh, a planning form example. This one, we've got Monday through Friday across the top. And they've chosen to focus on different topics. So we've got our social time, outdoor time with blocks, art, fine motor and manipulative, dramatic play, emotional, language and intellectual, music and rhyme, Bible study, 
sand and water time, science and nature. So this one, again, they've chosen different things to, to focus on. And, and as a center director, this may be something that you choose as well. What are we going to do every day? So you, you'll notice at the top, at social time, it says routine and blank. Well, at the bottom it says group routine includes ABCs, numbers, vocabulary words, song, and a story. So they have their basic plan sort of spelled out. And this is fantastic for a beginning teacher because it gives you this structure that's already there, and then it's up to you to do the planning. So great example. Okay, let's look at, here's one that's filled out. Now those were weekly plans. This is a plan for one single day. So we may have our monthly plan. We may have our yearly plan. Let's back up our yearly plan. We bring it down to a monthly plan. We bring it down to a, a weekly plan. And then for our daily plan, you get even more specific. And for your daily plan, when you're first starting out, you need lots of information in there. So Monday, art is 8.15 to 9.05. You may even need to have your, your times written down. We've got what they're having for lunch that day, because they will ask you 10,000 times, what are we having for lunch? <laughs> and you'll tell them, and they'll forget. <laughs> so it's written down so that you'll remember. <laughs> We've got the words that we'll be covering what we're doing in social studies, what we're doing in math. This is for an older group. Our spelling list. Yeah, this is a good one too, Brittany. I, I like it for, for older children, definitely. Um, our reading workshop. Um, our calendar math. Review all words. And at the bottom it says, um, how do you form cursive letters for H, T, and P? So I'm going to guess that this one day example is probably for, I'm going to go for third grade with this one. Starting to learn a little cursive. Could be second, in fact. So um, what you'll do as a new teacher is you'll shop around. You'll read through these lesson plans. You'll pick the one that's best for you. And you might hate it and change your mind and pick another one. You might give up and create your own. It's just going to be a process that you go through. And, but you will eventually find the one that works best for you, that helps keep you um, on going, moving forward with your goals and um, help you know exactly what's coming next so that you don't have that kind of scary time of going, OK, what do we do next? What activity? What, what subject? Okay, so we went over, um, gosh, lesson planning, webbing, and those, those two things right there are going to help you so much when you do your final project, basically. So I wanted to sort of focus on those for tonight so that you guys will feel more solid. You'll be ready when that final project is due, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, right? Does anybody have any questions right now? <laughs> and be sure, hey, just let me know which ones that you needed. I might even do it as a group. Now, here's the thing, though. Most of these were just pictures because I pulled them off images on Google. I wish you could actually type in them. But one of, uh, one of the lesson plans that I gave you a link for for our final project is one that you can type into and then print out. So you, you'll need to look at that one as well, OK? Any questions? Um, Autumn went to sleep, by the way. She's in her box, and she's chicken snoring right now. <laughs> she's worn out. She just doesn't like crowds. Thank you, Bailey. Have a good night, too.